All right. Well, let's get into it. Welcome to the Napoleon Bonaparte podcast. This is uh, episode 61. My goodness. My name is Cameron Riley. With me in his uh, studio in <laughs> Toronto, Canada, is the Honourable Sir J. David Markham. Welcome back to the Napoleon podcast, Sir J. David. Well, Cameron, it's it's, a, it's amazing to to find to find myself doing this uh, after all all these many years. But it's wonderful to see you again. You're you're looking great. Uh, I'm a little jealous. You've you've got a lot more hair than I do, but then you're still quite a bit younger than me. So you know, time time will tell. But uh, and as to my studio, I didn't know we were going to do video. I might actually have tried to clean it up a little bit, although uh, we're doing uh, home renovations and and that's very difficult to clean things up right now because everything is is stacked here, there, and everywhere because you have to get the walls clear of everything so they can move things around without destroying my artwork. <clears throat> And you'll forgive me, I have a little congestion issue, so my voice may not be its normal melodic self, but uh, we'll we'll make do. I think I'm but probably it's... around about the age now that you were when we started the podcast nearly 20 how, years ago. How old are you now? 57 or so? 53. 53? Yeah, well... I'm 77, so I, I was older even then, but I'll be 78 later this month, and that's really kind of depressing to think about, but, or maybe it's encouraging to think about, because I remember when, when I was young, like in high school or, or, or undergraduate college, you look at actuarial tables, and 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 men had an expected life expectancy of around 65 or 66, you know, so, mm. so I've at least beat those odds. Mm. And they didn't even drink the amount of medicine that you drink so and i'm uh, and sorry maybe, that's, I, maybe you're pickled maybe that's why you've lasted this long you mentioned them yeah i could be so someone once said that if i get cremated which which is the plan i'll probably just go just like that but <laughs> but uh, unfortunately right now even though it is uh after five i'm i'm nursing a cup of uh, tea right well, uh, just before we get into talking about Ridley Scott's film, I want to point out for people who are wondering, because I was, a Napoleon series, which I'm going to, I've said this many times on my other shows, and I'm going to point it out again, was the first ever long form history podcast in the history of podcasting, uh, as to the best of my knowledge, still to this day. Not necessarily the first history podcast. There was one other podcasts that had done some history stuff on Byzantium, I think, but they were doing like one episode per emperor. We did 60 episodes on Napoleon over the course of a couple of years. It was also, I think, uh, one of the longest, probably still is to this day, the longest series on in any medium done on the life of Napoleon. And thirdly, uh, it's been a long time. So we we finished the series in 2010. We did one special episode with our friend Nicholas Stark, I think early in 2011 on Haiti. And then we had the author Andrew Roberts on talking about his book, Napoleon the Great, uh, late in 2014, about nine years ago. But essentially it's been 13 years since we finished the show. Incredible. Uh, nine years since we've done a podcast <clears throat> together, except we did shoot some video in Vegas with Ray in 2016. But as right. in terms of podcast, it's been nine years. So that's a long time between drinks, especially for you. <laughs> yes, it is. And I want to start out by uh, saying, first of all, it, it's so wonderful to see you again. You, 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 you look great. I've enjoyed hearing from you from time to time on, on Facebook and so on. <clears throat> I'm actually planning, really hoping to come out to, to see you guys in Australia. But I want to make a, a kind of a special comment about about, about you uh, and, and yours. Uh, back when we had the International Napoleonic Society Congress in Corsica, God knows how many years ago that was. It seems like it was about 1895, uh, something, 15 something along. 15 years ago, 2008. Jeez. Jesus, 15 years. That's just unbelievable. Uh, 
we had you <clears throat> forgive me we had you come to uh to 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 do some recording and do some podcasting and so forth and and it was also a good excuse to to, to get together in person uh and we had a, a small group of musicians from from uh, Seattle, a school in Seattle uh, that that were coming down to do a, a little musical play on on Napoleon and and one of the people who was in that uh, little entourage was a, a woman named Chrissy who was singing the uh, uh, the role of of Josephine in 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 the play and the idea that we had between us was that you were going to always be there with me and you know we would do on the spot recordings this that and the other thing and i remember you know i think one time we were going into the mansion the bonaparte mansion and where's where's cameron where's cameron where, where, where is he He's not there and a couple other times where's cameron he's supposed to be here where is he not there and then later on, I began to realize, and I think maybe we talked about it, that you were spending some time with, with Chrissy. And my first reaction was, wait a minute, isn't it my job to seduce beautiful young ladies? Who, who, who does he think he is? That's, that's, that's where I come in. Uh, <clears throat> but as we all know, uh, the two of you have worked out absolutely wonderful together, and you you together created a delightful young man named Fox, who I've, I've only met once in, in person, but but everything everything I see about him and the reports and pictures that I see, he's he's clearly just a delightful young young fellow. And, you know, I love Chrissy and you to death. And I, I have to say that it's it's one of the happy points of my life, one of the the warm feelings that I get to know that uh, I, I had th that that kind of a role to play in, in in bringing you two together, and so I thought you since you've been, us. yeah, you 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 posted some very kind things thanking me for that, and so I thought I should I should return the favor in kind by telling you that the pleasure was all mine. Believe me, my friend, the pleasure was all mine. And, and as I recall, you kind of blackmailed me. You emotionally blackmailed me into going there in the first place. I had another thing I was supposed to do that week. So um, there's a very famous Australian artist passed away uh, called Brett Whiteley. And I've been obsessed with Brett Whiteley as long as I've been obsessed with Napoleon. And that same week that I was supposed to, well, that the, the INS event was on, I had been invited to go down to Sydney to uh, shoot uh, some video with <laughs> Brett Whiteley's widow, Wendy Whiteley, who runs his estate, and the curator of the Art Gallery of New South Wales that was doing a major retrospective on Brett Whiteley's work and was a friend of his. And I really, <clears throat> really wanted to go down and do that to get an in to the Whiteley estate and the Whiteley world. And you invited me to Corsica, and I really couldn't afford to fly all the way to France and couldn't afford that amount of time away. But you kind of, you know, said, well, I've organized, I've got this thing and we're going to give you an award and I really think you should be there. And I was like, oh, I'll <laughs> go just to shut Markham up. And uh, turns out, seriously, the greatest uh, thing that ever happened to me meeting Chrissy. She's uh, the, my soulmate, the love of my life. We are uh, uh, blissfully happily married. We we do Kung Fu together. We learn Italian together. We've traveled the world together. She's my best friend. And um, we'll be forever grateful that you brought us together. Well, if the pleasure and was mine. Napoleon brought us together too, as I always say. Yeah, Napoleon, Napoleon brought, brought us together. It just like Napoleon brought Ed and I together, the same, the same go. kind, kind, kind of thing. Also at an INS Congress. And know? where was where was that in Ridley Scott's film? Napoleon yeah, bringing but, together and, and, lovers. And and by by the way, uh, the podcast had had a lot to do with it because she she came across me through yeah. the podcast. You yeah. recall she she wrote you asking something and you sent yeah. it to me or whatever and and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. Podcasts on Napoleon. Yeah, so that that has been wonderful. Um but you know, let's get into the film, David. Um yeah. now I saw it a few weeks ago now, so uh, and I 
wrote some notes as soon as I got home because I knew I would have to cleanse it. I had to like burn some incense and <laughs> cleanse my palate, my brain from the experience. <clears throat> I believe it's doing well at the box office, reasonably yes. well, but it looks like it's not going to get its budget back. So it's it hasn't been financially successful, but people yeah. are going to see it because it's it's been marketed as a big blockbuster and Ridley Scott's obviously got uh, quite a career behind him and a reputation. Yeah. You saw and, it, uh, I think, and, about a week ago, right? It's, I think it's pushing two weeks now, but uh, something oh. like that. Uh, on the big screen, IMAX and... Uh, uh, you know, but let's just say the the evening experience started off really bad. We're in the IMAX theater, and we get there a little early naturally. Uh, so we've got reserved seats, and so we sit down, and the place starts to fill in, and right in front of her, actually, just slightly off to the right, uh, from for me in the, in the next row forward, is a rather large gentleman. Uh, and, and every time someone would be coming through and have to go past him to get to their seat, he would stand up and let's just say, I'm pretty sure his profession was being a plumber because I was treated, if you will, to a rather substantial plumber's crack mm -hmm. every single time that he stood up and I, you know, Ed and I were just groaning, you know, not, not, not out loud, but uh, it was like, no, it's, oh, well. So, so maybe that started my mood off bad toward the movie, but the ironically, and, and you may disagree, first of all, People ask me overall that I like the movie or not. And I say, I didn't, but I could see why someone who didn't know much about Napoleon, didn't care to know much about Napoleon, wasn't going to notice some of the oddities, you know, like World War I trenches at Waterloo and, and so forth, not, not going to notice things like that just kind of wanted a, a pleasant action period film, I can see why it's, they might find that not too bad. And I think that's probably why it gets as, 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 as many people coming to see it. You know, they're looking at it, and I don't want to sound insulting to them because I, I don't mean to be, but they're looking at it from a relatively simplistic, you know, point of view, you know, not from a historian's point point of view. And, and and to be honest, first the good news about the movie, uh, you know, uh oh, someone's peeking her head around the corner. <laughs> uh, to be honest, up through the coup, I found the movie to be reasonably decent. Reasonably, I thought the Marie Antoinette guillotine scene, for example, captured sort of the emotion and, and you know what it what it was probably like whether it was historically completely accurate i mean she was already in prison when she went to the guillotine and they seemed to have her in you know in a palace somewhere uh and there was certainly no reason to put napoleon in the audience uh he, he was definitely not there uh and they, they could have shown him reading you know a, about the the execution you know wherever else uh, he, he might have been and I thought the chaos of the coup was was pr pretty decently well done. I mean, it was chaotic, and and it was not clear who was going going to win, and 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 so forth. Uh, they even played some original French revolutionary music, like like Saira and some others. Now, it wasn't always obvious that Lucien was in the scene. They could have made that a little bit more clear, but. But again, I thought just sort of the the ambiance and, and the the sense of the chaos probably was was okay. Now speaking of family, uh, you know, we never see Josephine. Uh, a little, little more family dynamics would. I mean, we never see Joseph. Sorry, not Josephine, of course. Uh, and 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 you know, it'd be nice to see a little more family family dy dynamic. Uh, when they we saw Madame Mayor, she was entirely too nice. Uh, you know, and that was that's that's actually uh, Edna's uh, comment about that. Uh, 
<clears throat> and speaking of music, and then I'll then I'll stop and and, and let you re re react to what I have to say. Sometimes the music was very appropriate, like I said, the the Saira and some of the other French revolutionary songs that they had. But I never heard a, a recognizable Napoleonic march anywhere. They played a, a, a lot of sort of amusing classical pieces, but none of them seemed to actually relate. Now they got a lot of this, uh, a lot of complaints about the polyphonic music that they they played for a while there, and and and, and they had to remind me that's Corsican music, so it's appropriate. But it, but even more appropriate if they were showing some flashbacks to some of his time on Corsica, so that we we had a sense of his heritage, where he came from, <clears throat> and and you know the fact that he in, in fact was not was not mainland French, you know, it was a, it had been a colony for only one year or, 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 or uh, you know, uh, the Partimont or whatever. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we could have used a lot more clarity, but anyway, up through there, it was, it was acceptable, even I think as a historian, okay, you really think you got to put Napoleon there. Okay. That's a little bit of artistic license and it. It doesn't really hurt anything, you know, but, but after, after we get through the coup, it begins to go south in a hurry, in, in my view. Over to you. <laughs> well, in terms of it being good entertainment <clears throat> for the uneducated masses, I went with my sons, Hunter and Taylor, who are now 23, uh, I think. What year is it? Yes, they're 23. <laughs> and um, neither of them know anything about Napoleon, uh, not interested in Napoleon or history generally, They, but they like movies. Yeah. Uh, they got tickets to the premiere and invited me along as their guest. Um, That's nice. Yeah. I mean, nobody invited me to the premiere as uh, the, you know, the co-producer, the producer and co-host of the uh, first Napoleon podcast. No one cares, but anyway, I, I, some, aside, I somehow never, I somehow never got invited either for, for even in spite of the podcast and being a French night and, and, you know, 20 books or whatever, but you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> probably for good reason. Cause they probably knew how we'd react to it. Um, <laughs> that could be. But after we got out of the film, before I gave my view, I said to them, okay, what did you think of it as, you know, just as entertainment? They both said they, they thought it was horrible. It was boring. It was incoherent. They, it was jumping all over the place. They couldn't follow the storyline. They, they really didn't like it. And I'm just on Rotten Tomatoes. It's got a 58% score from the official reviewers and a 58% audience score from over a thousand verified ratings. So it's a, yeah. it's a, a critically a flop. People don't yeah. like it. And I'm sure they're not all Napoleon buffs that are reviewing it as well. So, and, and I agree uh, by the way, with your son's analysis about it about bouncing around and, and not coherent. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. So I, I don't know that it's uh, successful on any level. I mean, I, look, I went into it expecting to be mildly disappointed. You know, historical biopics for people like us that are interested in history are always going to be slightly disappointing, but I make yes. allowances for that. It's entertainment. It's Hollywood. I don't expect it to be history. If they futz with a little bit of things to make it more entertaining and they abbreviate things and abbreviate characters and merge them, I'm fine with that. But I came out of this thing absolutely furious, thinking it was not only a travesty of a film, but was such a, a, a missed opportunity to tell a, a somewhat accurate story of Napoleon that captured the essence of Napoleon. It didn't even capture what I think is the, the essence of the story. And in fact, if I sat down and wrote down the list of the 10 or 20 key points that any film about Napoleon would have to touch on in order to give somewhat of a sense of who he is and why he was important then and why we still remember him now and why so many books have been written about him in the last 200 odd years... I think this film left out 99% of those points or obscured them or screwed them up. Like you, you would almost have to have deliberately set out 
to make the worst possible film about Napoleon to get it so wrong as Ridley Scott did. And that's the first point. Don't don't put a British guy in charge of a film about Napoleon. How how are you how, unless it was maybe Andrew Roberts? Uh who how can you expect a Brit to accurately tell the story of you know probably the the second greatest enemy the British Empire has had in the last 200 years. I mean, I think the three great enemies of the British Empire are, in the last 200 years are probably Adolf Hitler, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who forced them to break up the empire, <laughs> the Atlantic Charter, <laughs> which infuriated <laughs> Churchill, but he couldn't do anything about it. Um so, yeah, I, I thought it was horrible. And the, the thing that straight off the bat, I mean, I agree with you. Like the Marie Antoinette thing was fine. I think the whole coup um, was messy, messy. They didn't really explain it very well, but it was fine. But from the get-go, my issue with Joachim Phoenix, and this is this was my feeling when we heard he was cast, is he was way too old. He's probably 48, 49 when they shot the film. Uh, looking maybe a bit older than that, quite frankly. And Napoleon's supposed to be in his early 20s when the film opens. I mean, he's he's a young, um, ambitious, uh, brilliant young man. Um, and here we have this pudgy, uh, middle-aged guy playing him. And so the first issue I had is his age and the casting. And I, and I love Joaquin Phoenix. I probably love everything he's ever done outside of this. Huge fan of him <laughs> as yeah, an Yeah, I like him too. He was wonderful, The Gladiator. Uh, yeah, well, I hate that film, but, you know. Oh, he, he... <laughs> well, here's another area we disagree. I love Well, <laughs> look, I don't think Ridley Scott's made a good film since maybe Thelma and Louise in the early 90s. But anyway... Um, that aside, he just looks depressed and morose throughout the entire film. Now, okay, that may have been uh, acceptable once Napoleon's on Elba or St. Helena, but my, in my mind, Napoleon, for the first 25 years of his career, he is not Mr. Morose. <laughs> he is not Mr. Depressive. No. He, he well, is a man of intelligence, vivaciousness, energy, excitement. He is, he loves, he loves his life. He loves what he gets to do. He loves being in the cut and thrust of things. He's a man of action. He's, he's vivacious. And that just, yeah. from the very get-go in the film, that did not come across at all. Like I, I spent the whole film going, why would anyone follow this guy? He just looks like yeah. he wants to curl up in the corner and cry. He doesn't. All right. He's not a man of excitement. You're you're stealing you're stealing my thunder because <laughs> I I totally agree with you. I, in my notes, I I write my biggest bone of contention with the entire film. Where was Napoleon's charisma? I I I'll I'll even bypass the age thing. Okay, because they're 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 going through a long period of time. They could have tried to make him look younger, you know, like they you know, they, they they did with uh, Harrison Ford in, in the most recent uh, Indiana Jones thing. Uh, they they could have done something like that with CGI or whatever. But 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 uh, laying that aside, and you're right, it it, it, it you know it, it's kind of a head scratcher that that they would do that. Uh, there was there was no charisma there. It did not show why his soldiers were loyal to him and loved him. You know, even even if he 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 gave out medals with a side comment with such bobbles men or, or lead would have been a good explanation, even, even though it's kind of cynical. Uh, and but I, and they wrote down that right after the movie that one of the first things I said was Napoleon was too pensive and surly. His yeah. expression never seemed to change. No, now, <laughs> like like a broke like a broken clock, which is right twice a day, an old analog clock. I'm talking, of course, that worked on in some scenes. There were some scenes where okay, he 
probably would have been, you know, a little pensive or or or, or unsure or whatever, but not most of the time. And and, and frankly, it became quite quite tiresome. You know, I, I, you, you, whenever he would come on the scene, it was kind of a downer, you know, because mm. he, he was the same as he was every other time we saw mm. him, you mm. know, uh, and again, you, you, you have, and this is so important to me. If, if there's this, one of the signature characteristics of Napoleon was the amazing loyalty that his soldiers and and his his other supporters and people and government so on they loved him they supported him they followed him you know literally across europe uh and you have absolutely no idea why you have Mm. no way of understanding how he could get anyone to follow him up a flight of stairs, much mm. less to Russia or or or, or mm. Spain or or wherever, mm. you know. I just I so I'm agreeing with you. I I like Phoenix. I think he's a good actor. Unlike you, I liked him in Gladiator. He is a bad guy, you know. He played a bad guy pretty well. I thought. Uh, <clears throat> I thought that was good casting. You're totally correct. This this was. It may have been good casting if the actor had been told, now, you can't be surly and pensive the entire movie. If you don't like making the movie, just tell me, and we'll find somebody else. But otherwise, lighten up when you're supposed to be lightened up. (laughs) It was obviously a a calculated decision between him and his director that Napoleon was going to just seem cynical and bored and grumpy throughout the whole thing. No understanding of Napoleon. Now, uh, moving on from that, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, okay, before we move on from age, obviously the age of Vanessa Kirby, the actress playing Josephine, <laughs> bugged the hell out of me as well. She was about 35 when they shot the film. He's 49. So there's like a 14-year age gap between them, which is quite obvious in the film. Yeah, of and course, in the wrong direction. <laughs> in the wrong direction. Josephine was an older woman, and that yes. was, I, I've always believed, part of his attraction to her He wasn't very sexually experienced or experienced in the matters of love. He'd had a couple of affairs. We know he was very romantic. He wrote love stories. He was he was a deeply romantic character, which partly comes from his Italian heritage, which again is completely ignored. I'll get to that next. Yes, but the whole thing about Josephine in my mind has always been that she was an older woman. She was very sexually experienced when they met, very confident sexually. She and she touches on that in the film that she's had many lovers, but she was a she was an aristocrat. She was a um, sort of had had somewhat of a you know a, a hedonistic French lifestyle before the revolution. Had had many lovers, and I think that was part of his attraction to her as she was this older woman, sexually confident. He sort of was besotted with her for that, uh, along with other reasons. Completely missed by the film, casting her as younger. And, you know, the way that he's rutting her from behind like a horny dog, which I think was the only thing Ray Harris liked about the film, he told me. Um, (laughs) He could relate to that bit. It was, it was just like, I just found that offensive. Um, Like there was again, like just this characterization of Napoleon, like where is the deep romantic in Napoleon? Like that, that guy that wrote love stories who, who wrote these deeply passionate letters. He came across as just, um, I don't know, just very simplistic, even in his relationship with Josephine. Gen- generally speaking, you know, I I certainly agree that that the age gap is is absurd in in the movie. I think she tried to do a pretty decent job at acting as Josephine. I, I, I and maybe that's only because Phoenix did such a terrible job. And as an aside, by the way, remember uh, 
Phoenix had a lot to do with with how the movie came out. You know, he was apparently having a lot of input, and both he and Ridley Scott have been quoted as saying some pretty bad things about Napoleon. So your your point about you know, I I, I don't want to paint all British with the same brush, but these two Brits in particular were never going to have anything very positive to to show about Napoleon based on what we know about their own personal things. Now getting getting back to sex because anyone who knows me knows I that's what I like talking about the most even more than Napoleon I mean he was like a schoolboy you know yeah. that, that that's that's he was he was he, not just inexperienced but but absurd uh mm. the the sex scenes to me were a joke as a for well for one thing you if you'll forgive me as a fan of the Game of Thrones series I I was unhappy she never even got naked in fact I think they were fully clothed in every single <laughs> encounter. You know, yeah. they, they they could have shown a little romp in bed. Now, you know, I'm not looking for an X rating. I mean, they, they could, but they could have shown that they actually didn't always have full 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 dress uniforms and and and, and gowns on. Uh, mm. They 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 made it a parody, uh, and and it was a parody. That's exactly yeah. the word for it. Yeah, it was a parody, yeah. and, and sometimes. You know, the power dynamic between the two of them was impossible to, to figure. Even in mm. one scene, it went back and forth in a way that didn't make any sense at all. In fact, their relationship, it, overall relationship, I don't think was was done very well, mm. and including, by the way, how they met. Why include the myth of the young Eugène coming in asking for his father's sword. I mean, that myth was around for a long time, but it's been dispelled. It's almost certain that they met at one of the many balls that were being, that were being given uh, at, at the time. And, 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 you know, that, that's, that's the way they met, which is a very normal expected way that people would meet. No, well, I think Why in change the film, that. Well, they didn't in the film, they do meet at some sort of a function. Then later, Eugene comes to him and asks for the sword, and then Napoleon takes it to the house. I think it wasn't really clear in the film, but it seemed like it was he used that as an opportunity. I mean, very unlikely that he would do that in the first place, personally deliver it, but it looked like he was doing it as an opportunity to get into her good books and to meet her again and to sl slide into her DMs, as the kids say these days. <laughs> um, so he did meet her outside of that, but yeah, the whole, like there was no sense in the film about why he was attracted to her, why she was attracted to yeah. him. Um, it was just horrible. I, I did, but before I did we get, get sorry, a before, go ahead. I was just I, I, before we get stuck into that, I want to point out, you know, one of my biggest issues with the film is there's no coverage of his. Croatianness and his Croatian experience, which again I think Corsican. You mean? You sorry, said, yeah, I said, wrote Croatian. You, you said Croatian. I'm, I'm going to say you you you're, you're breaking new you're breaking new ground here, my friend. <laughs> I wrote Croatian in my notes for some reason. I must have had Croatia on my mind um, at the time. His Corsican roots and his Corsican experience, because that is so fundamental yeah. to Napoleon's character. His I said to my boys in the car on the ride home, <clears throat> the fact that he was essentially Italian, Italian blooded, he he, you know, the the his experience as a child when he gets sent to military boarding school, the kids make fun of him because he can't speak French very well, he can't write French very well. He comes from, you know, a a, a once upon a time, aristocratic, but now kind of yeah, economic struggling yeah, yeah. family. Um, and he was an outsider when he was in the French military. Like his whole outsiderness, I think, is such a key to his character, both yeah. as a child and then when he, you know, when the revolution breaks out and he goes back to Corsica to try and fight for Corsican independence from France and then gets rejected by the the leadership of the Corsican revolution. And then he has to go back to France and basically reinvent himself now as the leader of the French. Like all yeah. of that is such an important key into 
what makes him tick, his outsiderness, um, and again, just completely uh, ignored from the film. Did that bug you as much as it bugged oh, me? It, it- it, it it did indeed, and it's in my notes, but I want to back up just for a second because I want to slip this in. There was one scene in that That's what deal he said with... to Josephine. Back up a minute, I want to slip this in. Sorry, yeah. keep going. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, double entendre there. Un, un, unintended, to be That's sure. Just, you, uh, dirty mind. Yeah, I think it just comes natural. Uh, yeah. The... Uh, uh, the 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 scene with Eugene and all of this. I love the scene where Napoleon decides, okay, I'm going to give this kid the sword, and he goes out back into the storeroom, and there's you know 150 swords or more back there. All of them look pretty much the same, and and no one's kept track as to whose was whose, and uh, and so he just sort of randomly picks one to take. And I noticed. They don't show him making sure it's not engraved with somebody else's initials on there, you know, which would have been a real embarrassment if you give it to the kid and the kid says, uh, who's RJ, you know, or, 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 or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, back to the Corsica thing. Yeah. Other than playing music, which most people had no idea. I even forgot that that was Corsica music. And they had to remind me. And we've got some CDs of Corsica music. Uh, they They did nothing about it. Uh, they, they they never had any scene on Corsica. I know there's time limitations, so I can see, for example, why they might not have decided to to deal with him going back to Corsica, be, becoming you know uh, a lieutenant colonel or whatever he was there, and 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 uh, try to fight for Corsican uh, independence. I can see them leaving that out in in this short version, short almost three hours. Uh, but not having something about Brienne or, or the Cole Militaire, even, even as a flashback, you know, him remembering his days having mm. problems with French and being looked down on by the aristocratic uh, uh, officer corps there. Because remember, he got there because his father was a minor no- nobleman. And, and and Louis says, Louis the Sixteenth actually signed his, his uh, uh, not, not diploma, but, but his scholarship uh, uh, authorization uh, when, when, when he got this scholarship to go there. Uh, so he was he was there with the the hoi folloi of 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 his generation, uh, and it didn't always go well. You know, he he did show himself to be quite brilliant as a student, uh, and uh, and I'm not saying let's let's have the Abel Gantz endless snowball fight, you know, which seems to have gone on for about the same three hour period, uh, <laughs> but but uh, they they could have done something something more with that. So yeah, they 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 chose not to do anything to give us an idea of where he came from. What he had done before the 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 coup, basically, uh, and I think I think they could, even if they took just fifteen minutes of something, to give us a little bit more of a grasp of who this guy was. It could have just been done in one minute of exposition, either him telling somebody or somebody telling somebody else. You know, he's not yeah. really French; he's Corsican, and. You know, he doesn't they, fit in. He's an outsider. They you could know. have even introduced it with a voiceover, you know, giving a little bit of background to the man before the scene starts. You know, mm. there's a lot of ways they could have done it. As you say, not even 15 minutes, one to three or four, you know, and and that would have at least answered some questions. Okay, so my next big issue in my notes was the too long um, coverage. I mean. He just seems to rock up at Toulon, take command of the cannon, and goes over the walls, and it's victory. There's no mention of uh, well, two two big issues with Toulon. Secondly, uh, firstly, there's no like the the time that he spent at Toulon trying to get the commanding generals there to pay attention to him, and just getting ignored. And uh, over and over again, while he's trying to tell them how to win, till finally he's given a chance. And the plan that he's been trying to tell them all along comes to fruition and is successful. There's nothing about that. 
But the big issue, when we got out of the film and I was talking to my boys, I said, let me ask you a question. Remember in that Toulon, the first big battle scene, they're, they're fighting the British who are, who are off the coast of Toulon. Let me ask you a question. What the hell were the British doing there? Why was he fighting the British? And they were like, yeah, I got no idea. I, I did wonder at the time, what, what have the British got to do with this? There was no explanation. No attempt at explanation that I, I'm aware of in the film. And that could have been done. It, he was fighting the British at too long. That, like, that, I, that could have been know, done in, in one or two sentences, you know, uh, when he, someone sends him to go down there and, 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 and defeat the British because they, they, they are, they've captured this town, which is, you know, not being loyal to the revolution. I mean, it wouldn't have taken, you know, more than two or three sentences. But the, the, you know, the again coming back to this idea that there are some critical things you need to explain to yes. to 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 understand Napoleon and 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 his life, right? That's right. The key thing you and I banged on about this endlessly in our podcast, and it, to <laughs> me, it is the fundamental thing that no. you know most people misunderstand about Napoleon. And 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 again, we can talk, we'll talk about the the final um, credits and how they depict this. All of Napoleon's battles against the European monarchs were defensive, because the European monarchs were trying to defeat Napoleon so they could reinstall. And before Napoleon, the the revol the, the revolution the, 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 the first yeah the first coalition was against the revolution to reinstall the Bourbon monarchy. The French were there because they wanted to reinstate the Bourbon monarchy because it was anathema to the kings and queens of Europe and the nobility of Europe that you could overthrow your monarchy. If they allowed that to stand, the, the Americans had already separated themselves from England. That was bad enough. But for the French to topple their own monarchy and execute their monarchy was absolutely could not stand for the British, the rest of the British monarchs. They had to shut that shit down because if, if that was allowed to succeed, then, well, what are the rest of the people in Europe going to do? They're, they're all going to want to overthrow their nobility. Yeah. And we can't yeah, it allow wasn't that. Just, it wasn't just a British monarch that, that wasn't going to stand it for it to, to succeed. It was the, I would say, arguably even more the 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 European monarchs on on the continent because they they could see the handwriting on the wall. You know, if if the French are going to do this, uh, uh, who 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 what's the next domino to to fall? So I I totally agree. There was no explanation of this. I will say though, the I can again I can understand why they have to compress how long it took Napoleon to, to be listened to at Toulon. You know, I can see why they, it, it, it makes reasonable sense from a movie point of view. Okay. Send them down there with some explanation, which they didn't do, you know, but send them down there and have them take charge right away. That that's okay. That that's, that's not totally accurate, but it's also, it's artistic license. It's it's that's along the order of having Ney at Laffrey that they did in the Waterloo with Rod Steiger. You know, they Ney was picked up a, a few days later in a different location, but that's compressing things a little bit for the sake of keeping it moving. So that that didn't bother me nearly so much as it apparently bothers you. And I do think they didn't do too bad. I see Fox crawling behind you there. Uh, they didn't do too bad uh, with with the actual <clears throat> approach that Napoleon took to defeating the British, going up on those 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 uh, forts on the hill. Because I've 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 climbed up there, I've been there. That at least, unlike some of the other battle scenes that I'm sure we'll get into, that at least had a certain level of historical accuracy. That really was how they forced the British to 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 leave. Uh, so I'll give, I'll give him credit for that. But again, explanation would have been again, even just in a conversation, mm. filling us in on, on mm. why they're there. Mm. You make a very good point on that. But compressing things is fine, but this is at the beginning of the film, like part of 
explaining Napoleon's story, even as a young man, like with the, in his where he first gets command. Mm -hmm. I think you have to tell the story that he was brilliant, strategically brilliant from the get go. And he was surrounded by morons too. That's the other yep. part of the story. They did exactly. touch a little bit upon that, that, you know, the guy in command was a, was a painter or something like that, but right. they, you know, the Napoleon's strategic military mind from a, as a very young man, he, he, because of his passion uh, his study of of the campaigns of Caesar and the campaigns of Alexander, et cetera, et cetera. He, he knew how to think about military strategy as a very young man. And, uh, you know, you could have just taken a minute to show that no one was listening to him because he, he was a nobody and he was wet behind the ears. But finally, when they listened to him, everything worked because he just understood this stuff at a fundamental level. His, fundamental appreciation of military tactics and strategy should have been, they should have taken time to build that up because that explains the next 20 years, right? Like yes. if you don't lay exactly. the foundation for that, when you're telling a story, you, you have no appreciation for why he then wins battle after battle, after battle, after battle. It's because he, he took that stuff, more seriously than nearly any other commander in Europe at the time, because he, he wasn't being promoted because of who his father was. He wasn't being promoted because of how big his estate was and how much money he had. He paid like, into her. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He was being promoted because he got shit done. He was effective and he, because exactly. he was a, he was a passionate student of, of history. And, and that's another thing that we'll get into they like they have they did not even begin to demonstrate his passion for history for science for politics for philosophy his studiousness you know, like you never see him uh, with his nose in a book you don't see his traveling library of a thousand our, volumes our, that he took with our, him everywhere are pouring over maps he, he he loved maps and he would he would think through everything by looking at these this assortment of maps that he had i don't think we saw a map the whole the whole movie yeah like it's they just don't try and capture the essence of him as an intellectual in fact they you know with the whole rutting scenes with josephine they paint a complete opposite picture of that he's not an intellectual he's a brute in this he's a <laughs> what is um, Judy Dench described Bond as in the first uh, of the new Bond films. She's like uh, a blunt instrument. Something I wouldn't like expect that, yeah. a blunt instrument like you to ex understand it, Bond. They they picked yeah. him as a blunt <laughs> instrument when he was yes. completely the opposite of that. Like they don't go into the writing of the Code Napoleon. They don't. You know, like, his <laughs> well, intellectualness just gets completely avoided. Drove well, me to nuts. be fair, we. To, to be fair, we don't know if he had a blunt instrument or not because we never see it. But, but yes. <laughs> Touche, <laughs> Sir David. Uh, all right. After Toulon, we, we do see here, well, there's no army of Italy. There's no Arcola. No. There's none no. of those early um, campaigns outside of Toulon, but where you see him grab the standard and run yeah. towards the bridge and, 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 and he's you know and that's exactly right and then i both both picked up on that uh if you're trying to show how the, his how and why his soldiers loved him so much uh, even a short 10 minute segment on italy you know where he gives his speech, which he may or may not have given precisely, but I'm sure he gave a speech, something like that. Soldiers, you are naked. I will come and, you know, follow me and I will bring you riches and so forth and so on. And he mm -hmm. proceeded to do just exactly that. You mm -hmm. know, they, they, they could have shown our coal or, or, 
be the best are called Lodi or or you know any any of any of the Italian stuff and and they could have had a brief scene of him entering a city and and freeing the Jews you know how about showing one of one of the signature things that he did even as a general was was to remove restrictions on 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 Jews and you know given the world situation now that's it's, it's kind of kind of extra appropriate but that's you know when you start thinking about the major good accomplishments that Napoleon had that's that to me is is always one of them and that would have also showed you a compassionate side and another reason why he became popular because he he cared for for the people he wanted he believed in egalite you know equality uh you know those sig symbols of the french revolution uh and so he was even though the Brits don't like to admit this, certainly in the beginning, and I would argue more or less throughout, really a child of the revolution, and in mm. many ways was constantly promoting the, the basic ideas. Even when he, came, when he became emperor, he was still promoting some of the basic ideas uh, of, of the revolution. Uh, and imperfectly, and, and, and he, did he make mistakes? Of course he did, you know, there's no question about it. But I agree with you. A little, a little bit of Italy, you know, which, by the way, would also show us why, because of his success in Italy, he was picked to go to the, uh, you know, go to Egypt, and and where where they have him go. You know, we have no idea why. Why is he? You know, this this so as far as we can tell, nobody. Uh, mm -hmm. Was it because of Toulon? No, it was because of Egypt that he, he was because of Toulon that he got the rank that made him a, a choice to go to, to Italy, you know, but it was the, his success in Italy that put him so high in the minds of, 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 of people that, that, uh, you know, he, he was the one that they, they picked to, to first of all, look into seeing whether they could invade England successfully. He mm. rightfully came to the conclusion now was not the time never was going to be the time as it happens but you know then was not the time for sure so how else can we get to the brits well we can go to egypt and by the way they have him in egypt they don't really explain why he went to egypt either mm -hmm. all they do is show this absurd napoleon firing cannon at the pyramids which he never would have done. He never did. He never would have mm. done. He had too much mm. of appreciation for history. Plus, mm. there probably were never any French cannons that close to the pyramids because the Battle of the Pyramids happened miles and miles away. Now, it's flat territory, and it wasn't built up like it is now. I don't have any doubt that you could see the pyramids from the battlefield because they're very big. And, you know, if you if you get outside of Cairo, coming from a different part of Cairo where it's not all built up, you can you can you can see them very clearly quite quite some time away. Uh, if you're coming in from the airport to Cairo, you you occasionally get a glimpse of the if the buildings align just right, so you have a a window, you know, briefly as you as you drive by it. But uh, uh, so again, a missed opportunity uh, to to give us some idea why he's there, and you know they they could have and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know they could have shown something uh, about his savants that that he had with him, you know, show, getting back to your idea of his interest in, in, in learning and education, they could have at the very least shown soldiers finding the Rosetta stone. Hmm. You know, you, you can, I, I was there this last summer. You can, you can go in Alexandria to the exact spot in the wall of this, of this little fortress where the Rosetta stone is. And you I, I've, I've, have not, posted pictures of it yet but you, you can see the outline of where the stone was you know and it's they nearly, there and i thought they were going there because you see him when he's in egypt get taken to see something special come this way and i was like oh they're gonna have him seeing the rosetta stone no it was uh some the mummified mummy. remains of something yeah. it was which he puts completely... his hat on the top of you know it, it just yeah it was just it, a, no it was a silly silly pointless scene <laughs> It now, could have been I, the I'm sure 
But yeah, and, and it could have been the mummy, and he could have said, "Wow, this is amazing." Have have our scientists try to to get the, the age or, or find out more about it. He they, yeah. could, they could have used a mummy as a way to bring in his interest in science. But well, uh, the, he, again, okay, lost so opportunity. Mike my my key issues with egypt apart from the cannons and the pyramids thing and the rosetta stone is no explanation for why he was yeah. sent there in the first place not exactly. only about you know his plan to try to get to india and 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 give give england problems but also because the directorate were trying to get rid of him because of how popular he had become they saw him as a bit of a, a potential threat to their power so they were like let's let's get rid of him send him off to egypt and uh, we yeah. won't have to worry about him for a couple of years secondly they, 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 they were they were in a win-win situation they, they they figured either he'll be wildly successful and we'll drive british influence out of the area or he'll get killed either way yeah. win yeah with win-win and secondly their explanation for why he came back from egypt was completely bogus they have him coming back because he's heard that Josephine is sleeping around. To my recollection, yes. that's not why he came back. He came back because he knew that moves were afoot. There was going to be a coup and he knew that he needed to be there when the coup went down. So he was trying to get back to Paris to, because he knew that if, if events, if political events happened when he wasn't there, he could end up on the wrong side of, uh, you know, who who managed to take power. So he went back to play a role in the in the coup. <laughs> I don't think she realizes that we're videoing this. <laughs> oh, that's just, she does. She's been crawling around on the floor to try and stay out of camera shot. <laughs> hi, hi, Chrissy. How you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> she can't hear you, but uh, I'll pass it on. Yeah. We um and then yeah. thirdly no no right. mention of trafalgar and nelson which i don't really care but i i was surprising that a brit didn't cover nelson because the brits all love lord nelson secondly yes. i do think it's important there is a throwaway <laughs> line at some stage where he goes oh the british think they're so special because of their navy you could have seen them completely destroy the french navy at trafalgar which would have explained again a yeah. little bit about why he left egypt yeah the, you think you're special because you have ships yeah exactly so you could have explained okay so the, they they you know lost their navy in egypt um and they were outmatched and and nelson was brilliant and so, you know, they could have touched on that, you know, would have been a great opportunity for this big, like he, he had this beautiful scene of all the ships at Toulon, could have done the same yes. thing for a naval battle yes. at Trafalgar, but I agree. Uh, I know. agree. Well, you know, and, and uh, not, not showing why Napoleon was going to Egypt and, and uh, you know, not giving any explanation whatsoever for that. Uh, really doesn't make any sense, and then not showing again his you know, the, the savants and 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 the maybe the the meetings he had with uh, you know the Institut d'Egypte uh, you know which he which he created uh, there there was just such a lost opportunity, and there were there were two naval battles, either one of which would have made the point that that you're making. Uh, one was the, the 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 Battle of the Nile, where his ships were improperly lined up, and that's why he was stuck there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there's Trafalgar. But I wanted to also say why he left. Why he left was actually fairly co complicated, and you've 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 touched on much of the essence. Uh, he wanted to be where the action was, but he also thought they might ask him to return to Italy. Which he, of course he eventually after the coup he did, uh, because all of his gains in Italy had been squandered, and and uh, all all of the good work that he that he did, which got him to where he was, were 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 no longer there. So at the yeah. very least, he wanted to go there and if if, if at least have the 
whatever government was going to end up being in power, uh, you know, send him back to to reclaim those 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 wins. And of course, he ended up. And I don't know if he necessarily expected this, although I think you're right. He kind of wanted to be around just in case, you know, he was asked to be to be the sword, you know, of mm -hmm. of, 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 of of the coup. And uh, and, and and so that's 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 what happened. Uh, and uh, they don't they don't really explain how he became first counsel and so on, which maybe isn't all that important. But. You know, again, but, we're 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 gonna be like we're gonna be like broken records, but it has to be said, it was a, a lost opportunity that would not have taken that much time to to fit things in so you have some understanding of this. And if you need to make up time, take out the cannon scene with the pyramids you know? <laughs> well i think this is one of my points in my notes they, there is no mention of how he became first consul and right. that again is <laughs> one of the key points to the napoleonic story in my mind is how they brought him in as just the sword and within minutes <laughs> he had played he was so brilliant he had play. He played the game in. Is a bit like um, I don't know um, Caesar, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of Pompey or, or, or Augustus getting rid of uh, Marcus Antonius. Like he was in a power sharing arrangement, and quite quickly he's the last man standing because he was just more brilliant than the other guys. They thought they were bringing him in as the muscle, but really he was the brains and the muscle. I have a theory, and, and you're absolutely right. I have a theory about how he became first counsel because I don't think I've ever mm -hmm. seen a, a good accounting of this. I may even have read this somewhere, but knowing the way Napoleon was, they, the three of them would have gone into this chamber where the three councils would meet across from each other. And the first council's chair was slightly more, they're, so th they're, three were supposed to be equal, but the first council was first among equals, if you, if you will. And my theory is Napoleon took the initiative because we're going in there, who's going to say, I'm giving, I'm guessing he was, would, would have just walked in there, sat down in that chair, and that would have been the end of it. He would be first counsel, and the other two could retire to their estates after a while. You know? yeah, exactly. Um, so then it skips almost immediately from him being first consul to him being emperor. There's no, like the assassination attempt, um, <laughs> There's there's no discussion or explanation or even debate between him and say Talleyrand or Fuchsia or anyone about why it's important. He felt it was important that the French had a throne, uh, you know, the, the issue of succession, the issue of tradition, the fact that the other monarchs of Europe would be forced to treat him with respect and, and as an equal if he was a monarch. Um, and again, like this whole idea of removing assassination as a way of removing... exactly you know, him and, he, you know, the, the the Bonapartist movement, none of that is explained. And, you nope. know, again, one of the key things you need to tell, you need to tell yeah. that story to explain why he went from, why the French went from killing a king to having an emperor again. It's a pretty big deal. And they just skip right over it. And you know, and uh, you're absolutely correct. I, I I could not agree more uh, with you. And as I as I've been talking with you, I, some thoughts I had earlier have sort of come back to mind. Uh, they could have had voiceover occasionally as you're shifting scenes. You know, five sentences about what you just said. You know, while you see 
the the coronation procession you know and going down down the line you know just some voiceover or even text you know text you know transitioning you know after assassination attempts the decision was made to make napoleon an emperor with the hope that the the crown heads of europe would treat him with greater respect i mean one or two or three sentences you don't even need to to show a major scene about it you can just as the scene is transitioning and you're watching a procession which doesn't even require your full and complete attention you could have had something like a voiceover or or, or texting you know to to explain what's happening next it, it would not have taken any more time at all in my mind and i've always said this like if if i could rewrite history um stanley kubrick would have made his napoleon film in the 70s and he would have cast al pacino as napoleon in his heyday but you know that that scene in the godfather part two when there's an assassination attempt at um michael corleone's estate in lake tahoe and later on he's with frankie pentangeli in uh the godfather's old home in new york and he says the thing about where my family sleeps where my child plays with his toys exactly like that kind of anger they tried to kill me i'll show them you know yes. who the boss is that kind <clears throat> of a scene like you just could have had the assassination attempt uh on his carriage and then him furious and saying what are we going to do to you know, remove assassination as a as a mechanism. How about you and Talleyrand? You know, well, maybe you make yourself king. Um, but they also completely skipped over the murder of the Duke Dongyong, and yeah. and again, I think, like from in my mind, one of the key moments when members of the elite of France start to turn against Napoleon is with some of those missteps if we if we accept for a moment that he had some responsibility in that you know there's some doubt as to whether or not he was personally involved personally responsible but let's say he did and it happened on his watch either way um you know why the elite started to turn against him in some small measure uh, no, no mention of that. They just skip over all of those things. Why he became emperor? Why some of them turned against him? And also, you know, some of them turning against him when he calls himself emperor, or when he re when he creates a throne. Yeah. You know, this whole idea of hold on, we just went through a civil war to get rid of uh, the nobility. Now we've got a new nobility. Uh, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. Could have been a couple of conversations about that in dark rooms, in alleyways, in uh, could have been a little. All, you know, all, all, although Napoleon's popularity did continue to be very, very high even after he became emperor. And by the way, whatever we may think about the 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 legitimacy of the Duc de Aguillen thing, it did succeed. Royalists never again tried to to assassinate him. Uh, mm. You know, and the Duc de Aguillen. <clears throat> Might not have been as innocent as some people, you know, want to make him out to be. There's there's some evidence that he was involved in some of the plotting that was going on and so forth. So, you know, he wasn't just a an innocent, randomly selected noble person that they wanted to use to make an example. I mean, there was some evidence that that he was that he was in, in engaging in some some things that we would not approve of. Now, does that justify, you know, the 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 execution and the invasion of another country and so forth and so on? You know, we, we can we can talk about that, but it, in some ways it might be splitting hairs uh, because it, it was done and it did work, <clears throat> and it's hardly unique for that period of history for for someone to 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 be off like that. Exactly. I've just, you know, Ray and I, been, we did the, we did Nero series and Caligula series, and um, now we're doing Galba. But you know, plenty, plenty of precedents of uh, assassination attempts uh, or conspiracies against oh, yes. uh, uh, emperors of uh, Rome. Uh, before that, uh, before before the coronation. Which I thought was handled well, although I would have loved it if they'd pointed out that Madame Mayor wasn't there 
that she had <laughs> said, screw you all, I'm not turning up. That yeah. would have been nice. And, and, and then also having to paint her in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also they what they 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 could have done somehow <clears throat> is explain why Napoleon crowned, you know himself instead of this i found the crown in the gutter and picked it up with my sword crap which if he ever said that at all it would have been when he came back from the hundred days you know it was not something he would have said he could have said i crown myself to symbolize that all future leaders of france will be based on on their personal accomplishments and achievements and not you know, on 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 some religious deification or whatever. You know that that would have, again, been a very easy thing. Just change the words. It didn't take any more time at all. And 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 uh, you could even say, and 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 the Pope has accepted this or something. As the Pope the knew pope about that, it, Pope knew. Pope and that that, I've, I've had in jail for the last eighteen months. <laughs> <laughs> but but the Pope left. The, the the coronation scene before the coronation was over because the oath that Napoleon had to take as emperor called for, among other things, freedom of religion. And the mm. Pope, of course, had no interest in freedom of religion. He wanted to go back to the days when this was a Catholic country end of discussion. Mm. You know, we may would have occasionally loved... tolerate others. I would have loved more story about you know napoleon ending the holy roman empire and and you know his battles with the pope and the church and all that kind of stuff but i but before we get even to the coronation by the way i love the i found the crown lying in the gutter and i picked up with my sword line i love that i'm glad they have that in there historically accurate <laughs> or not it's one of my favorite lines um before that they have the marriage of napoleon and josephine where they, for some reason, make the decision to read out their dates of birth and got them, not only got them wrong, but seemed to deliberately move them closer together. They they said 1768 for Napoleon as the date of birth, and they made her 1766 so despite the age gap between the two actors, as we mentioned at the beginning, he's 15 years older than her, they made her supposedly older than him, but only by two years, by moving her date of birth up a couple of years and his down a year. Well, historically, which... they did change. They did change the date of birth. The birth certificate is inaccurate. I don't know. I don't remember exactly how inaccurate or whether they changed the year of birth for Napoleon. I'd, ha I'd have to go back and 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 look that up again. <clears throat> but they did change the the dates to make them seem to be closer together, because in those days you didn't really want to have too big of a gap. You know, people would talk. You know. Uh, and, and it was, it was only also like six on... years. It wasn't like they were twenty yeah. years age gap, like no, you no. and Edna. They were like yeah, six know. years. Yeah, but six years in those days was 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 a, a lot. And by the way, <clears throat> twenty years at my age is one thing. Uh, twenty years if I was twenty some years old would be would be another. <laughs> you know, so you know the the perspective of a, a certain set age gap changes as time marches on. You know, if you're if you're twenty five, you're obviously not going to fool around with a five-year-old you're probably not going to fool around with a 45 year old either you know but when you're 65 which i think i'm i, I was i was 65 when when and then i got together you know okay well 45 that's that's that, that she's a perfectly you know grown woman and can make her own decisions and 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 eyebrows may get raised you know some will look at her and say what were you thinking and others will look at the guy and say lucky you <laughs> you know kind of thing but but uh uh so that's it my my, my point is the age age gap differs and and so they were quite young and so six years maybe in 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 in, in the early 19th century that 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 might very well have been uh just a little bit too much i don't know or 18 late 18th century i should say all right let's talk about austerlitz 
<laughs> must we gee oh. how time flies i've got to run now <laughs> <laughs> i just wrote all i wrote was butchered in my notes just butchered well i have two words i my, my notes say the battle scenes were well overall the battle scenes were overly simplistic period all, all battle scenes hmm. the Auschwitz battle was just plain ridiculous so I think we're going to be on the same page on this one. Why were the Russians and Austrians attacking the French camp at Auschwitz? There's no indication of the brilliance that he lured them off of the high ground to attack him so he could then take the high ground, you know, and, and control that. A, a little bit of the dynamics of battlefield maneuvers and tactics, even just a little to show his strategic genius. That would have been nice. And the frozen lake scene. Okay, it never happened. They eventually dredged that lake. They found three, count them, three bodies. So, yeah, somebody mm. probably did fall through. Mm. And by the way, a retreating army is fair game. And so if the scene really had happened like that, it would not have been some horrible war crime or whatever. You, if an army turns around and surrenders, you got to stop, stop shooting and, and accept surrender. But if they're trying to live to fight another day by running away and regrouping, you are more than legally able and morally able to, to fire on them. And so maybe it would have made sense to sink them all into the lake. But the fact of the matter is it did not happen. And instead of concentrating on that bogus crap, they mm -hmm. could have concentrated on, okay, why were the, 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 the allies attacking Napoleon's, camp down at the low because he lured them there in interviews he seemed uncertain he you know oh i don't know i don't know where our position is weak you know and he lured the the austrians and russians to to get off of the high ground and then surprise surprise he sweeps up and takes the high ground and completely turns the tables on 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 the situation and they don't touch that at all they'd rather waste their time firing into a frozen lake yeah it was like again like i keep coming back to this conclusion that to butcher this so badly it had to have been deliberate they yeah, had to I deliberately so. try and paint him in the most negative light they could yeah uh, other, there's no other explanation for it. Here is a perfect opportunity to demonstrate his strategic brilliance, and they just yes. take it in the completely wrong direction. I could not agree um, more. You're exactly right. There. Okay. So then it seems to just, <laughs> as, as my son's pointed out, one minute he's signing a treaty with Tsar Alexander, and they're all friendly. The next minute, he's at war with Tsar Alexander. There's no yeah. explanation why. There's no, there's no explanation at all. And this, again, for me, one of the key things, his... So you never see in any of it, it's not, not covered, that whenever he defeated one of these European monarchs, he didn't strip them of their throne, didn't strip them of their titles. He kept them on their thrones. He he was very benevolent whenever he won a victory. He would sign a peace treaties, which there were reparations and they were sometimes harsh peace treaties, but there's a cost of going to war. They were the aggressors. That's fair. Yep. Um, there, it's, there's a cost of going to war. France lost men. France lost, you know, uh, they had to spend money. They lost gold on these campaigns. There had to be reparations to pay for all of that and to try and prevent them from doing it again the following year. But th there's no explanation about how hard he tried to maintain his diplomatic relationship, particularly with Tsar Alexander and Russia. And the way that Alexander was manipulated by his own nobility to break the the friendship and i and i think how personally that hurt alexander because i think he genuinely did feel brotherly towards napoleon he looked up to napoleon he admired napoleon he admired the progressiveness of france did you watch the um catherine the great series that ran for the last couple of years done by no. an australian 
director. Oh, it's really great. I highly recommend it. It's just called The Great. It's about Catherine the Great, and it's uh, it's a farce. It's comedic. It's not historical. It's, you know, and they say that at the beginning, every title. This is very, very, very loosely based on history. There's a <laughs> lot, you'd like it. A lot of nudity, a lot of sex. Very, very funny. Who, it's a who comedy. plays it? I mean, what, 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 what network? Uh, well, I think it's Hulu in the US. Here okay. it's on one of the Australian streaming networks. Yeah. Um, uh, the, pro the problem with Hulu is that's a subscription service. That's probably why I haven't seen it. I mean, right. we do we do have one or two subscription services that we get as part of our cable package, or and I think we we paid extra for one because it had a lot of stuff we wanted to see. <clears throat> but uh, you know, there's 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 so many of those separate streaming services out there now that you can you can pay quite a bit of money uh, if you try to get all of them. And I barely. I, I barely get any work done anymore anyway because I watch so much news and sometimes sports on you know on TV at night and and we watch some series like I mentioned earlier I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan and and so on of course that's that's done now but but uh, we've we've seen some of the follow-ups and some of the star Star War follow-ups that, that that have been on because I I love anything to do with Star Wars I'm, I'm a big fan of. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I'm, I'm not sure I would dare subscribe to very many more of those things. I've got some books I'm working on. I've got, I've got to find more time to sit at my computer here like I am rather than in the other room on my iPad, you know. I have the opposite problem. I subscribe to all of them and then rarely watch any of them because I'm too busy. But Money wasted, yeah. Um, it's a great series. But, you know, it, it's all about Catherine the Great's desire to... Uh, you know, make uh, Russia more progressive uh, like France. And, uh, you know, I think Tsar Alexander, you know, had the same aspiration to some extent. But Gee, no, he no, certainly mention, did. no mention of, you know, how he just cut off all diplomatic ties with Napoleon, kicked his ambassador out, stopped returning his letters, cancelled the marriage to his sister. And, you know, I know we went through Napoleon's letters. He pleaded with Alexander. He begged Alexander, don't do this. Don't yep. go in this direction. We're so close. We can, we can unite our kingdoms through marriage. You know, there'll be a century of peace and prosperity yep. for everybody don't and there might do it. very there might very well have been and then of course there's no mention in the film of uh, russia then building up a force on the border of poland the duke of warsaw whatever it was at the time and napoleon's uh feeling that okay i need to th this is obviously leading to war he has completely uh shut me out he's ghosting me as the kids would say today um, he felt, you know, I mean, I, 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 as I always argue, it was a defensive war. He knew that they were getting ready to invade. Oh, yeah. There was, there was no, no question. No question about that. It was a question so, about where do you want to fight? Exactly. And he was like, okay, we'll go in like, like your hero, George W. Bush, uh, in the Gulf <laughs> War. We'll, we'll go in. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have a quick victory and oh. then we'll be straight out. Six you, week campaign. Please, we'll be in. Please we'll win. Get back. We'll leave. Get back. If, if if you think that that W is 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 my man, I, please get back I, get back on your meds. You need to I get back on to, your meds. I swore to Chrissy I would not bring up politics in this, and I I failed. Oh, it, was, it was a no, cheap that's... shot, and I had to I had to go there. Um, uh, of course, but, you know, but we would analogy, expect nothing less. The analogy though is the same. He thought it would be a quick victory. <clears throat> he thought he would defeat the Russians. They would go, okay, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Let's get back to where we were, and he exactly. would he would he would recover the treaty uh, th that they had signed at Tilsit. No mention of that. No mention of why he's gone to war with Russia. No mention that the winter of eighteen twelve were came earlier than all the almanacs predicted. It was that it was far more serious than any winter they'd seen in a century. No mention of, uh, you know, any of the, the the circumstances around that. I mean, I did like 
you know, him riding into the Kremlin. I did like the yeah. scene of the fires. The fire was well done, I thought, yes. Yeah, that was all fine. But no explanation about why he no. was in Russia in the no. first well, place or in, in, why the return was so devastating. You, you, you're you right. And, and again, a, a, a quick conversation with Colin Kaur, uh, or even even Talleyrand, if you wanted to bring him back in again about about what's happening, uh, understanding. I mean, they had a scene where where you know Napoleon suggested marrying his sister, and the excuse was she's only fifteen. Well, that that wasn't much of an excuse. For one thing, they could have been betrothed for a couple of years and then and then married. Uh, but it, it was the age. The age was the excuse. It was the czar's mother, and it was the czar's family that were opposed to it because they hated Napoleon. Even though the czar, as you say, was a big fan of Napoleon in many ways, and it was also the aristocrats slash business class of of Russia who felt they were going to pay a heavy, heavy price with the continental system. And no so mention really, of the continental what, blockade. Exactly. What really, what really turned the, the tide between the, on, on their friendship was the continental blockade. The, the czar felt he had to, to leave it. And he also was making it clear he was not going to tolerate the grant, the, 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 not the grant, the, 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 the duchy of Warsaw, you know, uh, independently there on, on, on his border. Uh, so as you say, the, there's troop buildup in, in, in that area and so on. Uh, and, and, you know, Czar busily settled things uh, in 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 Turkey. He settled things with Sweden. You know, he he got all of his ducks lined up. You know, cleared the decks of any other things that he might have to deal with militarily and or politically. And as you say, it was it was clear it was going to to be war. And so Napoleon. Uh, said, well, I'm a man of action, and I'd rather the devastation all take place there rather than me have to wait here and 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 the people in 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 in, in, in Dutch of Warsaw pay 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 the price, you know, for having an invading army. <clears throat> and again, as you show the troops marching, you could have a voiceover or some lettering if, if, if you don't want to have a conversation showing that. And by the way, you mentioned the, the winter. It's not normally understood. The biggest loss of horses and men was going in because it was so hot and they were wearing winter uniforms. And the horses were, 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 were dying from lack of water and so forth. So it was in many ways worse going in than it was going out. <laughs> Irony, and you're right, all, you're, you're absolutely right about the winter coming, you know, three to six weeks earlier than, than was expected. But ironically, it would have been better for the French if it had been as severe a winter as you would normally expect, because the river Berezina would have been so iced over, you wouldn't have had to waste time building bridges. You could have just gone. Even artillery probably could have gone across because it normally gets really very thick ice. But because it was actually a little bit warmer a winter at that point, at least, than, than normal, the, the, the ice was, was not thick enough. And so they had to build those bridges. And they had they had left their bridge building equipment behind because they assumed, well, the the, the river is going to be frozen over. We don't need to build any more bridges. And when they got there, and it's 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 an amazing engineering accomplishment that Napoleon's engineering corps and and and, and soldiers were able, without their pontoon building equipment with them, they were able to build three bridges across the Berezina. It's one of the amazing feats. And maybe they didn't have time for something esoteric like building a bridge over a frozen river. You know, I'm hoping that in the four-hour version, I don't have a, a lot of hope for the four hour version, but I'm hoping maybe they'll throw some of the stuff that we're talking that is missing. They'll throw some of that in. And the 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 building of, of that of, of those bridges, it was just an amazing accomplishment. 
Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of hope for the four-hour version because, as I said, like th this version seems to have been <laughs> deliberately designed to paint the harshest picture they could of Napoleon. I mean, yeah. okay, well, if that... you say we we took out a lot of content to make a shorter cinematic version, that's fine, but you could have taken out, ta you know, crafted it in a way where it delivered the right story, not this deliberately Well, you've got... Story. You've got you've got two people who apparently think Napoleon was maybe not exactly equivalent to to Hitler because there's certainly no Holocaust that you can point to Napoleon having any responsibility for. You know the Holocaust is not the same as executing you know a relative handful of of, of prisoners who, by the way, had had violated parole. And 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 got what was coming to them, uh, in in Egypt, you know. So you know, but they use the two names at the same time, and they may they they've made it clear in their public statements that they don't like Napoleon. So hmm. I think we 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 both look at a movie and like to assume that the producer the director and the actors are going to try to play it straight. They're going to try to portray things the way they were and be balanced. I mean, look at, I think any other Napoleonic movie that we, that, that we've seen thinking about the Rod Steiger one, you know, from 1970, I mean, it, it, it shows some negative aspects about Napoleon, but it also shows some of his compassion, writing letters to, to widows of soldiers, for example, you know, before Waterloo and, and, and other, other things like that. That, you know, Steiger, who, who was a much more interesting Napoleon than Joaquin Phoenix would ever hope to be. Mm. Uh, mm. And, and you can like Steiger's, you know, uh, portrayal or not like it, it it's but i think you would have to anyone would have to say it was better than 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 phoenix's uh it, it at so least we had go into this variation in exactly tone. like exactly. he, he oh, was gentle he was harsh it had he had character yeah. it had depth oh, it, of character he wasn't unidimensional his, his face ex changed expressions every now and then yeah. you know uh but we may have this expectation, but in this case, for whatever reason, and I'm surprised because I respect Ridley Scott and frankly, I respect Hokim Phoenix. For whatever reason, they made, and, and you've pointed this out and, and, and I totally agree, they've made not only no effort to be balanced, but they made a concerted effort to be imbalanced to the negative. I mean, all the things that we think they could have tossed out have been negative things. It's real hard to find very many scenes where Napoleon is portrayed in a positive way or in a compassionate way. There are some scenes, okay, fair enough. You know, he's he tries to treat Eugene fairly, you know, even if he can't get the right sword, he's like, okay, I'm, I'm at least going to do this. Now he may have had all ulterior motives as well. Of course, you know, mm -hmm. chance to get to see Josephine again. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, time after time, after time, when they had a choice on what scene they could choose to, to use or how they could portray a scene that maybe was important enough to be in it, if there's a way to cast Napoleon in a negative light, mm. they they do. And now they 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 show him as a good leader, you know. Again, too long, you know. He shows that he's smart. He shows that he knows how to, you know. So it's not a hundred percent negative. He's not made out to be a complete dolt or anything like that, you know. But when it comes to the nature of the man and some of the things that were done uh, by him. They, they, they just don't make any effort to be at, at all fair, in, in 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 my view. And again, I don't expect them to make Napoleon into a saint. People hmm. think that I think Napoleon is a saint, and I don't. I mean, I know he made mistakes, and it's sometimes it was errors. Yeah, pardon, a minor deity, just a yes. minor deity. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, 
sometimes he made mistakes. Sometimes he he made deliberate decisions. Sometimes he listened to the wrong people. You know, when he when he reinstated slavehood, uh, slavery. You know, that was obviously a big mistake. That he was under tremendous pressure. I mentioned the pressure Alexander uh, was. You know, under with his family and 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 the business community and so forth. Well, Napoleon had the. The same kind of thing with uh, with with slavery, and and frankly, he made the wrong decision. And if in they Haiti, had included in about Haiti, for people. Yeah, yeah, in Haiti, exactly. If 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 they had shown that, which did actually happen, as mm -hmm. opposed to some of the things that didn't actually happen, like the frozen lake or whatever, I would have mm -hmm. said, well, as long as there's some balance. As mm. long as earlier in the movie you showed them restoring, you know, the rights to to Jews in in Italy and and maybe even again in Malta, and 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 then you want to have a little bow. Okay, that's that's fair enough. But there's no such balance anywhere in this movie at the level that you would hope for. Yes, there are some spotted scenes where Napoleon is shown to be a good leader, you know, and knowing what he's doing and so on. But they're they're overpowered by some of the nonsense. And speaking, you mentioned uh, Josephine's kids. Like one of my notes says, there's no mention of his relationship with Josephine's kids as adults. Like exactly, he, even after the divorce, you know, he had Eugene around him, promoted him. He, Eugene went to Russia. Yeah, he had a, you know, he treated those kids. Like they were his own children, he had a, exactly seems as far as I've ever been able to tell a very deep, warm, affectionate relationship as the stepfather to those children. Even after divorcing Josephine, and and look, I accept this film is really uh, it's about Napoleon and Josephine. It's sort of a yeah. love story. It, that's the focus, not his military career, not his political successes. <laughs> It's mostly about that, but then they get that wrong with the age and the the depth yes. of the relationship, etc. I did like the fact that they pointed out that she was a dirty hoe, um, as I've always said. <laughs> like she, <laughs> but to, and, and to be fair to her, he wasn't around a lot, and you know, she exactly. she was a sexually active woman. He's off yep. gallivanting around uh, Europe and Egypt and whatever, doing his thing. She needs to get some, you know, what do you, she didn't have vibrators back in her day. She, <laughs> does, she deserved her pleasure. But anyway, um, going on about stuff that they bollocked up. Um, let's uh, talk about, um, well, I, I do want to mention about what happens with Marie Louise and Napoleon oh, II. Oh, let, me, let me make a, a quick point. Another, another thing and to, to, to build on what you said. They don't even. I don't think they show Hortense, or no. maybe they well, show her, but there's no there's I no relationship. When, and I your point when he goes back to see Josephine, and she's passed away. That's, that's right. Her, she's there. That's okay. Hortense there, but they don't yeah. explain that. No, they don't explain that, and they, you know, to get to your point, and, and it's exactly right. You you must have listened to my podcast years ago. I don't know. Uh, the you know the relationship with those two kids. You know, when Napoleon is after Waterloo pondering what to do, it's her that's there with him, you know, and, and other people around, of course, uh, supporting him, uh, giving him a diamond necklace uh, to, to take with him uh, for, for money and, 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 you know, trying to help him in, in what was obviously a very dark period of, of time for him. Uh, and uh, I guess they hinted that you're right. I briefly forgot that that was Hortense when when he comes in Josephine. And by the way, why do they have Josephine's you know dying so late? And I mean, he, he she died long before then. He uh, he was on 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 elbow when 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 she died for heaven's sake. And I mean, the whole thing between her and uh, Alexander 
when he goes and makes a booty call on her. Um, yeah. I thought that was again. If you if you're short on time, why include that? What's the point of yeah. that story, really? Yeah, because they in fact were friends, and 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 in fact, when she got sick after get after the the the, the wet t-shirt contest, as I always like to call it, uh, he sent his personal physician, who presumably was a fairly decent physician for by the standards of the day, to see what could what could be done and that is presumably the physician that they show you know explain to her you know that she's got this set and the other thing going on so stay in bed so there's no mention of mario louise and napoleon the second again i think one of the like defining parts of napoleon's story is how badly he wanted uh an heir how badly he yes. wanted a son of his own he finally gets one and then <laughs> He's sent into exile. He never sees his wife or his son ever again. Uh, no correspondence, no communication. They, they, they're they just deliberately removed yep. from his life. And what kind of a tragedy. Again, as a hot-blooded Italian man, essentially, like his... <laughs> His desire for family, his 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 desire for a child, an heir. You know, we see his relationship on St. Helena, funnily enough, with Betsy. Um, and and you can see sort of his fondness for children a little bit in there. We don't see it with Eugene really or Hortense enough. Um, but he had a soft spot. Again, it reminds me of Godfather Part One at the end. Don Corleone is an old man running around with his grandson, uh, putting yep. the orange peel in his mouth, that kind of a thing. Yep. That's exactly but, right. Um, he, he had a love for children, but uh, you know, you, the, the, the tragedy of having his son ripped away from him, uh, you don't get to see. Then they have the, the whole story about why he left Elba. Again, just completely neglected in the story. The the monarchy not paying his uh, whatever it was the the promise that they pension. made. That the, they yeah. gave him. They they were going to give him and his family a pension. And and when the king said he wasn't going to do it, Wellington personally pleaded with him to do it, saying, "You you you you're asking for a lot of trouble. This this money means nothing to your budget." You're you're asking for a lot of trouble though if if you if you leave him hurting free money. And Wellington was right. Yeah, so the no mention of that why he returned. I mean, the way that's depicted is that he just got bored. Um, and I think there's probably an element of that, but there were there were genuine financial uh considerations and betrayal of the promises that were made when he agreed yes. to go into exile in the first place. I like the the march back to Paris, although they could have shown more about that. And, you know, I wish they'd included the line of uh, when he says to Louis, stop sending troops. I have more than enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> My <laughs> dear brother, <laughs> yeah, stop sending yeah. me troops. I have more than enough. Um, the, uh, then we get to Waterloo, of course. And now again, no mention of the fact that he begs and pleads with the monarchs of Europe. Don't, don't, let's not go to war again. Let me, let me sit here peacefully in France. I have no ambition. I just want to yep. build my country. Let's not do this. Uh, and they were like, you know, <laughs> screw you. We're, we're coming for you. No indication that he was suing for peace during this entire process, but again after he returns. Then he's at Waterloo, and, of course, the depiction of Waterloo was just abysmal. No mention of Grouchy, no mention of, you know, the, the late arrival of Blucher at four o'clock in the afternoon or whenever it was and how he nearly defeated Wellington. And then Grouchy arrives at the last minute with fresh yeah. troops and how that turned yeah. the tables. There, Nothing. There, there was, there, well, there was a little bit of that. I mean, they, they, they do have people looking out for, for, for Blucher and, and, and so on. And some, some of the fighting scenes were, were sort of okay. The squares, they, et cetera. Yeah, 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 exactly. But not as good as, as the Rod Steiger movie. The no. squares of the Rod Steiger movie were, were I thought, Bond better done. Film. Yeah. You know, and, uh, 
you know, but of course, the the two biggest absurdities of Waterloo was the the trenches. And mm. in fact, one scene I I I heard there were going to be trenches, and I thought, oh well, we'll we'll see how bad they are. At one point, someone commands them over the top, boys. Just exactly the same command that was given, you know, in World War One to 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 the doughboys that were in the trenches there, over the top. Never anything like that happened. I mean, the the closest thing to a to a, a trench was the alleged and apparently fraudulent sunken road, which turns out wasn't wasn't really there there either. Uh, and and of course. The, the scene where the guy has a possibility of, of shooting Napoleon. And I've read that that scene did happen that, that, uh, and it, it was also included in, in the Rod Steiger movie, uh, you know, that there was a chance at one point for one of the marksmen to say to Wellington, I, I think I got a shot at, 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 at the Emperor Napoleon and, and, and Wellington considered it beneath beneath the dignity of, of 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 such people to do that but of course there was never a, a scope on these rifles i mean I, I i i saw that i said where did they i mean this doesn't even make sense it doesn't it doesn't help you make napoleon look bad or better it doesn't help it's just a piece of equipment that you've added for absolutely no reason whatsoever, just like the trench. Why do you have them in trenches? You can have them behind a little a little hill or something, fair enough, but not a trench. No one dug trenches and no one had I did, scopes. I did like Rupert Everett as Wellington. I thought he had that air of pompousness, which yes. I, I liked. I was shocked to see how much he's aged. I mean, I can't yeah, remember the yeah. last time I saw Rupert Everett, but I just remember him as this deadly handsome dude in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, yeah. Um devastatingly handsome uh actor. He's aged well, I mean uh, I don't know if they've touched him up or how much they've touched him up for the film, but uh, I um but yeah, that was ridiculous. But I did like again, like this this <sighs> perpetuation of this the british uh, telling of waterloo that it was won by wellington's brilliance and not the key part of the story that actually napoleon had effectively defeated wellington his strategy was to divide wellington and, and uh, blucher's forces defeat wellington and then defeat blucher the next day grouchy you know we know the story screwed it up uh, allowed Blucher to get to the battlefield where Napoleon was, you know, had had planned the whole battle around yeah. the fact that he wouldn't have to deal with yeah. Blucher. He did, and that obviously, he, he, you know, he was outnumbered. Yeah. He was outpowered. Sure. No yeah. attempt to to explain the context of that which right just pissed me off yeah well you you meant to say to defeat blucher first and then wellington not the other way around but yeah i mean and i'm not even going to say grouchy screwed it up because you know after after the battle grouchy's troops were decamped they were cleaning their weapons they were eating and it took napoleon frankly a long time to decide what to do and meanwhile the prussians getting further further away they didn't send any scouts uh to keep a good eye on them you know from one of the other units they they they, they had all sorts of things they could have done and of course if they had just sent grouchy or somebody after them, you know, with with light cannon and stuff, and you know, kept firing, you know, put the is the expression of the sword in their back, you know, if they had done that right from the beginning. But I'm not sure it was Blucher's fault. I think Napoleon, frankly, you know, slipped up on that one a little bit. Grouchy's uh, fault. Pardon? Do you say you said it wasn't Blucher's fault? Uh, yeah, I mean Grouchy's fault. Yes, of course. Grouchy's Sorry. Fault. <laughs> uh, Clearly, I need more medication, but but uh, the uh, the uh, it was it was not explained. It was not it was not shown well. 
Uh, one could argue easily that that uh, Grouchy should never have been sent off against the Prussian. Let them run where they want to. Let's show up at, at Waterloo with the full force. And he have uh, 33,000 more men with him when he first gets to Waterloo. I think that uh, Wellington might very well beat a hasty retreat if he sees he's got Napoleon's entire army and Blucher's nowhere near, you know. To be nowhere to be seen, and they have no idea where he is. Now, how that would have ended up playing out in terms of Napoleon's staying in power, this out of the other thing, who knows? But, but uh, it, clearly, they needed to to have a lot more explanation about what was going on, and it wouldn't have taken that much more time. And some of it could have been with conversation. You know, uh, he could have been sitting around at Waterloo with his generals and they're talking and re recounting. Well, yesterday, yeah, we beat the Prussians at, at Linia. That was wonderful. It's too bad, though, that, that Blucher got away and we don't have Grouchy and his 33,000 men that we that we decided to send after him. You know, that could have been done, as, as you said, in some other examples, just in a conversation uh, while they're having breakfast. Uh, yeah. and and talking about the the, the, the wet ground for the cannonballs and, and, and so forth. Uh, it, and Napoleon's health on that day. I mean, they didn't, yeah. I mean, he looked so depressed through the whole film. You, yeah, could, he couldn't, you didn't really, he couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> yeah, that he was suffering from some sort of ma malady on that day that affected him. Um. So then we have the denouement of the film. We, we, you know, we don't really get a sense for the fact that <laughs> the, the allies, the coalition are marching on Paris, that he has to race back to Paris because Paris is about to fall. Um, we don't get any sense of, well, we didn't get a sense of that during um, the return from Russia either. In no, 1812, no. that he has to rush back to Paris. Exactly. We, we we just see him having a hearty hearty breakfast, where he meets with Wellington. Yes. At the yes. end of the film, everybody like, knows that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I don't really understand the point of that scene. Why they had to put that in there? Obviously, for people who don't know, he never met Wellington. That is uh, just no. ridiculous. Not there, not anywhere. Uh, I, I don't imagine. Well, he may have seen Wellington across the battlefield. He may have got his telescope and seen seen Wellington marching on the around on the other side, and, and vice versa. But that's the closest they would have ever ever come to to seeing each other. And certainly, no no conversations would would, would have been had. Uh, and it seemed to take place in England, on the so, ship. It was. Uh, I think it was, well, it was it was it was on the ship, but it might have been while he was in Plymouth Harbor. I think it was when he was he was outside of Plymouth Harbor Harbor, and they were going to transfer him to the other ship that was going to take him to Saint Helene. And he was a subject of great attention. You know, if Wellington actually had been there, I would not have been wildly surprised if Wellington wouldn't have said, "Hey, you know, he's our prisoner now." I wouldn't mind going and saying hi. I, I could see that happening, but he wasn't at Plymouth Harbor when Napoleon was there. He and, and the, the thing never happened. You say, why did they do it? And and I think the only explanation I can think of is that it's part of their effort to make Wellington look good. And, you know, to, to to, to show Wellington being kind of magnanimous toward his defeated enemy and, and going and paying his respects. That's the only, the only thing. And I don't know that's the motivation uh, for it, but I can't think of any other reason why they would make something up totally fictitious, yeah. you know, but they, but they've done that. They've made up things totally fictitious to the scope and the and the trenches that we just talked about being two other obvious examples that they did not need to do. There was no need to put a a late nineteenth century or early twentieth century scope on 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 a musket, 
and there was no need to do an early 20th century military tactic the trenches you know in an early 19th century battle where trenches were unheard of uh, and then of course they have the saint helena uh scenes um there's no mention of you know whether or not he was poisoned and no depiction of his return like they should have had him returning the his corpse obviously returning to paris i was gonna say are you coming up with some more history that i don't know about <laughs> yeah yeah then the, it's a if spielberg made it and i believe he is making a miniseries based That's what on they say yeah kubrick's thing i'm sure spielberg will have aliens come into saint helena and whisk him <laughs> back to paris um, be. No, the, 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 you know, the great procession when he's brought back <laughs> yeah. um, and, and the, the great tomb, his uh, remains interred at L'Envalide and all of that, uh, uh, none of that uh, depicted or mentioned, just the final graphic card that lays millions of deaths basically at the feet of Napoleon as if he was responsible, personally responsible for the deaths of millions and millions of men, which of course is, is the final nail in the coffin of the film. No, no mention that they were all defensive wars, that he sued for peace constantly, that the wars of the coalitions against France started before Napoleon was in a position of power and continued all the way through despite all of his attempts to sue for peace. Just, nah, fuck all of that. We're just going to lay all of this at his feet. It's his fault. He was the problem. Oh, man, I just, I was, I came home from the cinema and Chrissy's took one look at me and went, oh, wow, that bad, huh? <laughs> like, I was like, just, I like, I don't get angry often, David. I'm, I'm the coolest cat on the planet. I'm, I'm always happy. I'm always cool and calm and, and the collected. most modest too. <laughs> and the most best looking and the best lover and modest. Yeah. But well, I tell you, I was the, the, furious. Those last, those last three, I may, I may give you some competition on. Sure, sure. Um, I was no, I... just ropeable. When, and, and and I got angrier and angrier as the night went on. Like, the more yeah. it sunk in, yeah. the it, worse I felt. The, I was sick the, right the next day. The wording technically didn't say those were all the responsibility of Napoleon, but that's clearly inferred. what they meant. That's yeah, clearly the strong, the strong inference. And like you... That was the thing that made me the angriest, but I had heard, I, I was expecting it. I'd, I'd heard it was coming, you know? So, so, you know, I was, I was sort of prepared for it, <clears throat> but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, what, what, a lot of British historians claim, and I've seen this on Facebook and so on, Napoleon was responsible for all those deaths. And then they usually exaggerate the actual number of the deaths anyway, and they don't draw a distinction between soldiers, let's say, and, and civilians or whatever. And so, you know, I always want to say, well, really, uh, what percentage of 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 the deaths is the 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 emperor of Austria, you know, responsible for for his causing wars? How how much responsibility does do the Russians have? And what about the Brits, who while they generally, you know, until the end didn't really have troops in the field, uh, were bankrolling all of all of these things, you know, to to say. That all those deaths are because of Napoleon's megalomania, which is a term that you hear bandied about quite quite frequently, is one of the most absurd conclusion historical conclusions from this period of time that I've heard. Because there's there's no way that you can't say okay. At, at, at the very least, there's got to be a sharing of the blame because it wasn't Napoleon who was starting these things. And, and it, 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 you know, sure, French soldiers killed enemy soldiers, but whose fault was that? But maybe it was because the enemy soldiers were invading, you know, 
Uh, so maybe I won't, I won't exempt Napoleon a hundred percent, but I may come fairly close to it because when he was a general, he was ordered into battle. It wasn't like he had any choice and then there's, 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 there's not much you can do about it. Uh, when he was first council on an emperor, you know, it's, it's, it's not like, uh, it's not like he wanted to start these things. I, I, I oh. struggle to see how anyone lays the blame for it at Napoleon's feet. I mean, I will I will yeah. accept that Portugal, okay, there was you know, Portugal was his decision um to, you know, enforce the continental blockade. But outside of that, uh I I, I really cannot give any leeway to people who try and lay the deaths at Napoleon. Okay, so let's yeah. say Napoleon. I agree. I agree. Let's let's say he never became first consul. Um, let's say he never became emperor. What would have played out? Well, let's say the the coalitions against France had been successful uh, much sooner than they were, and they had been able to reinstate the Bourbon monarchy. Yeah, let's say in I don't know, 1799, 1800, whatever. Uh, then what? Okay, so maybe there wouldn't have been those wars of the coalitions against France, but we know enough about how these European monarchs, you know, were, were, uh, their relationships with each other. I mean, they ended up in World War One and uh, uh, fighting each other to the deaths of. Oh whatever yeah, whatever it was, and, they, and there were plenty. Of people. There, there were plenty of other wars in European history between various countries. I would go you one better though. I would say because okay, that that removes that that brings back the kings, and now we're back to the old rivalries between kings. Hmm. Let's say the Directoire proved successful and was not corrupt, was not incompetent that they actually were able to continue France for the 20, 30 years. So there's no Napoleon, even his first council, or mm -hmm. let's say they had the three councils, but Napoleon wasn't one of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've got a non-Napoleonic, but also non-Bourbon uh, right. government. Yep. I don't think they would have accepted that any no. more than they accepted Napoleon because it still wasn't the Bourbons. It was still a revolution replacing a king, yeah. and they, they, they couldn't stand that. So those wars would have happened had Napoleon been around at all or not. It didn't exactly. matter. So, so to yeah. say those wars were because of Napoleon's megalomania, because of his thirst for, for, for conquest is yeah. bullshit. Yeah. You know, it's just bullshit. And, and it, it makes me angry. Like it obviously makes you angry to hear that because if you just think it through, like you and I just did with two other scenarios, hmm. you're still going to have problems. Exactly. Well, that's all I have to say about that, David. We we have been recording for nearly two hours, nearly as long as the film itself. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought it was more than that. We start, I guess we started about a little, a little after five. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been about around two hours, a little, a little under two hours. Well, yeah. that's par for the, that, that's actually pretty good for us. I mean, we used to have, our average was about an hour in 15 minutes, if I recall, that was approximately average of the, of the old podcast, but we're making up for time. You know, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, look how many years it's been. We could have, we could have justified about a 12 hour podcast here. Mm -hmm. If, uh, if we, if we had wanted to, to try to catch up completely, but I, I think it's been a good conversation. I'm sure that I will, and, and you may well as well, uh, after we're done, say, oh, shit, I, I meant to mention that, or I forgot to say this, you know, I've looked at my notes, and as far as I can tell, I've covered everything in my notes, but of course, the notes are only things to to make sure I don't sit here and just stare blankly and say, movie, what movie, you know, kind of, kind of thing to you. Uh, but it, we, we've made some good points, I think, and I, I hope we've given 
you, the listeners out there, and, and those who, if you end up watching this thing on, on video, uh, you 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 will see two of the best looking uh, historians around and and who are legendary lovers, uh, you know, ac across continents. Uh, not not with each other. I just want to not with each other. No, 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 okay. <laughs> no, yeah, no, 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 yeah. no. Uh, with with the well, with the sorted assorted ladies over over time, yes, <laughs> sorted ladies. Before before we wrap up, like for people, I mean, everyone know well, not everyone, people who have paid attention to my other podcasts know that I've you know what I've been doing in the last 10 years uh which is just more podcasts really <laughs> but w what about yourself David like what have you been up to since we finished the series what have you done with yourself these last 10 years well of course I, I moved uh, 12 years ago to Canada uh living in downtown Toronto right smack in the middle of the heart of downtown by the by the very close to the waterfront, a seven minute walk from the waterfront with a beautiful view of Lake Ontario. I've, I've worked on uh, various uh, writing projects. Uh, uh, I'd have to go back and think what years various things came out. Uh, but I've had, uh, I've had uh, at least one book uh, come out simply Napoleon. I have another book I should have been out by now. I thought that was near and dear to you, simply Caesar, uh, the same same series, very very small. Uh, I've worked with a young man named Jonas Deneuf, uh, and 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 I've written some introductions to a couple of his very good books, and uh, he and I are doing one book project together, uh, and we're going to do some more. I've had. Uh, uh, one of my books translated into Spanish now, and the, the one on Napoleon after Waterloo, and it's also been translated into uh, 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 Polish, and that should be published hopefully by the end of the year. The the Spanish translation is available available on Amazon, where wherever you just search my name, and you'll see it. Uh, and as you know from looking at Facebook. Uh, we we've been uh, uh, undergoing major renovations in, in the condo. Both bathrooms are being one at a time being totally revamped, and then and then the kitchen, and then finally, I've been very fortunate, Cameron, to to do a great deal of of, of travel, uh, mo mostly with with Edna, sometimes for for conferences. Uh, sometimes, uh, one time I went with her to Saudi Arabia and, and, and in the process, we, we visited Jordan, uh, and, uh, she and I, you know, have traveled to, to, uh, uh, Cairo and, 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 uh, Tunisia and Morocco together. And also my, my ex-wife and very good friend, uh, Barbara has, and I have traveled some over, over these years as well to, to, uh, various places, including, uh, India and, and Egypt. And, and actually in, in April, we're, we're going to be in your general neck of the woods. We're going to spend two and a half weeks in Japan because Japan was always on her bucket list and she really wanted to go and asked me to go with her. So I said, sure. Uh, and we're, I'm planning a trip. I've got a friend that lives in Singapore now, and I've got a whole bunch of friends who live in, 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 in this, this odd place called Australia. Uh, and so I am definitely going to work, you know, be forewarned. Um, I'm definitely going to work on, on a trip. So maybe I can get Edna to, uh, to a little bit of Japan and, and, and then a few days in Singapore with Jonas Deneuf and then, and then maybe a week or more, you know, uh, in, in Australia. Uh, and then we probably head on to New Zealand. I've, I've got this map now, an interactive map that you, I found on the web uh, or on uh, Facebook, I think link uh, where you can, you can, plug in your whatever countries you've been to and they turn blue and then they turn various shades of blue depending on how many places you've seen in them and this summer when i went to europe for the ins congress uh i i i, I went first and then i went first to denmark oddly enough as much western europe as i've seen essentially every country in western europe I think every country by now i've never been to denmark somehow and that was country number 60 
you know, so you asked me what I've been doing. I guess the most exciting thing I've been doing is 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 traveling around, seeing the world. I'm I'm still in very good health. I I just I live under the tyranny of the Apple Watch, and I have to close my move ring and my exercise ring and my stand ring, and it tells me to get off my ass and get get, get in gear if it looks like I'm not going to make it. And I just today hit 995 consecutive days closing my move ring so you know five more days and i will hit a thousand and you know I, I i like to think that's helped keep me healthy enough to uh to be able to make all these trips and exercise supposedly fights off dementia i'm sure there are people who say it's not been successful in my case but so far i think it has been and uh that's great sorry and sorry for the long the answer yeah, exactly. I don't drink as much scotch as I used to. I'll be honest. I drink more wine than I should, you know, but drinking more wine than you should probably is better than drinking more scotch than you should in terms of the, the strength of the alcohol and so on. Did you know that our mutual friend, Tony Kynaston gave up drinking about a year ago? Did he really? No, I haven't heard that. Mm -hmm. And please say hi to him when you talk to him next time. I really, I really miss them. They were, they were so much fun to be with when they were living here in, in Toronto. And I, I was really, really sorry to see them go. I, I always enjoyed whatever time I had with them, including that wonderful visit he and I did to, to see you, you know, out, out in, uh, in Nevada. I did mention to him uh, that I would be talking to you this week. He said to pass on his re fond regards. And he also said to say that he misses Toronto and he would happily uh, live in Toronto. Um, I think if. Oh, if, please tell him to come if, back. If, well, if Alex was there, he would go. He obviously wants to be close to Alex. So sure, they're sure. still in Sydney, but uh, Tony and Jenny, but I think they're tr w waiting to see where Alex decides to base herself her and a her boyfriend yeah. sean she's just finished her master's in fine art so if, really if he God, stays time in melbourne, flies. I, I think they'll plan to move to melbourne but yeah he said he really could happily live in toronto uh yeah. he really really enjoyed toronto and where are you again now i'm in brisbane chrissy in brisbane, and yeah. i and fox and my boys are in brisbane they just live um around the corner still uh we've been i've been here for uh 15 uh years uh and chrissy's been here for 14 of those um and um yeah it's yeah it's brisbane yeah it's hot and humid a lot well it's we're going that, into that, summer and it's a really hot summer what are your winters like very very mild i wear yeah. t-shirt and shorts all year round here um, you know, I'm yeah. I'm really tempted to give you the one finger salute on that one. You know, don't don't I'm not, don't talk to I'm me about not bragging muggy. about it. I would much <laughs> rather live somewhere where we had seasons, but uh, we don't. It's just hot and hotter here. It's like dumb and dumber. This Brisbane's yeah. just hot and hotter. Well, that was that was the way it was in 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 Florida when I lived in South Florida. <clears throat> not quite that that much of a, a, a truth for Arizona where we actually did get snow once a year, mm. very light snow and it was gone by noon, you know, but, but, uh, but to tell you, we, we were in Arizona for a couple of weeks last year and um, yeah, I remember I, reading that. I fell in love with Arizona. I mean, not oh, it's the heat, it's, but the, the, the landscape and the scenery, yeah, yeah. Uh, it oh, it's is amazing. just magnificent yeah. and it so is. different. You know, you'll have one area where you have saguaro cactuses and then you go to another area where it's just red rocks and then you go to red mountains and, oh, spectacular. And then, and then you, you go you go north toward the canyon up to Flagstaff and, and it's it's huge we forest. Antelope enormous, Canyon. Yeah, yeah enormous forest. forests. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's no. It, it, it could be 75 degrees in Phoenix, you know, where I can sit outside and have a glass of wine or something. I can drive two, two and a half hours when I live there and I'll be in Flagstaff and there'll, there'll be a hundred inch snow base for me to go cross country skiing on wow. and two and a half hours difference. That's yeah. what's so cool about Arizona. I really uh, look forward to spending more time there. Chrissy's got a sister who lives in Phoenix and her mother's there now. And oh, really? Yeah. We look forward to 
I look forward to spending more time in Arizona. Really enjoy. Well, it. you let me know when you go if you would like us to join you and, and see you. I would love to get Edna to see Phoenix, and I'd love mm. to go back and and see what it's like. I can still find the house I lived in on Google Maps, you know, and see see how it, how it looks and how they've done the lawn and, and and so forth. And I find that kind of kind of fun up on North Twenty Fourth Street, up toward just on the edge of Shadow Mountain uh you know and if it worked out i'd i'd love to to go down and spend a few days i wouldn't intrude on on all your family stuff but we could we could get together for a couple of dinners or something and and, and chat some that'd be it'd, yeah, be, it'd nice. be great that'd be it'd lovely be wonderful yeah well hopefully we'll be and, back there in the next year or so and let's try to stay in better touch and that's as much my fault as anyone's you know we we all get busy and and we talk a good game about you know, let's occasionally, you know, do a little FaceTime all, or something. All your fault. I've been inviting you <laughs> constantly to come on a podcast with me and Ray to just catch up and chat on FaceTime. You never, ever, ever take well, me up on any of my offers. I, I'm surprised I don't know you turned it's... up today, quite frankly. I expected you to pull out at the last minute. I can't believe you're not, you're smiling. So I don't think you're serious about that. No, I was serious. I expected you to pull out. I thought you had, no, no, micro no. I thought you had, you know, microphone fear or something. No, no, no. And you haven't been constantly inviting me. You did invite me though, to, to be on a podcast. Uh, and, and I don't remember why that didn't end up happening. Uh, one you one time you wanted me to go on your 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 bullshit podcast or whatever you call that. Well, we did do uh, a couple I, of those years ago with um, yeah. our Secretary of State friend Doug Lafollette. Doug 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 Lafollette, yeah. yeah. But years I ago. always, yeah, well, that was different. But I I I seem to recall that that I I felt because we do have some political differences. You know, we're 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 both left of center, but 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 various degrees of left of center. Uh, we have some international differences and some political differences, and I, I had the feeling it's just going to turn into an, a big argument, and I wasn't I wasn't sure that I that I wanted to do that. But I I you know if you want me to come on and 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 talk about Caesar with the two of you sometime or or you know so, something else uh uh that you can come up with a, a topic uh, I I wouldn't mind doing that uh I've I've only met your your cohort in crime once but but I enjoyed his company there in in in, in Vegas and you know we all had a good time together and I certainly enjoyed doing doing that uh, three way podcast on the three three leaders that that we did uh so you know it's not like i've ignored you come on my friend i mean I, and there was never a question about me showing up with i'm 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 really sorry that you thought that because starting doing a a, a re a, you know a, a reboot of the napoleon 101 and talking about something near and dear to our hearts and which i knew we were going to be pretty much 90 and 95 percent in agreement on because we we both had huge disappointments in 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 that movie you know i wouldn't have missed this for the world well uh let me see what would, ray and i at the moment in terms of rome we're doing the year of the four emperors um in our renaissance show we're talking about the islamic golden age uh because we're getting up to the reconquista but we're going back to talk about the islamic golden age um in the cold war we're doing god what are we doing in the cold war show i can't even don't ask me i can't even remember let me hold on, let me see see if it's something that you're interested in what are we doing you should um, you should walk oh. more often <laughs> oh, you would love it. We're doing um, the overthrow, Operation Ajax, the overthrow of Mossadegh by the CIA. We've been going about that. We've been sort of doing the history of Iran in the early part of the 20th century. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's the sort of the main shows that we've, history shows that we've got going on at well, the, the moment. Uh, the, 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 the Cold War might be internet, that, not that particular episode necessarily, because I, I, I don't know much about that, but... Uh, you know, when when you get up, uh, you know, in, in, into to something something else, or you might you might send me a list of 
of planned topics and I can let you know. And and as far as uh, something on Rome is concerned, you know, once you get, you know, past early Rome, Caesar and Caesar Augustus and, and a few of the others, you know, my, my knowledge begins to wane a little bit. Uh, and until you get toward the end, I might, I might be able to contribute on something like that. And we could also just do an episode of something where we just sit around and, 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 and chat about, you know, how you, how we think the world is going and, and how, how our lives are and, 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 and so on and agree to disagree friend in a friendly way on, on some things and just sort of shoot the shit for a while. Well, that's the bullshit filter where we talk about contemporary the you know, contemporary news. So yeah, yeah, so we, we could did do one of those on Israel Gaza or about a month. We do about that. We do that usually about once a month for a couple of hours. Yeah. So I'll invite you to the next one of those, and if you want to come yeah. in and we'll argue would about have been, that for a couple I, of hours, that'd be fun. Yeah, <laughs> I would. I would have. Uh, I, I suspect we we would have been at loggerheads on the on on the Israel Gaza one. <laughs> oh, I suspect so. But we can talk about, we can come on, we can talk about that. We can talk about what's going on in Ukraine. We can talk about what's going on in your upcoming presidential election in the US. Oh, yeah. Oh, we I'd be happy talk to talk about, about all about those that. sorts of things. No, that'd be okay. fine. Mm, all right. You want, you want to talk American politics? I mm -hmm. I follow American politics religiously, as, as, as you know, you, you see my posts and so on. And I mm -hmm. imagine we probably agree on, on some things about American politics and, mm -hmm. and disagree on and disagree on others. Well, I'm sure you're not a Trump fan, for example. I'm a nobody fan. That's where we differ. I'm not oh. I don't believe in being fans, except outside of Napoleon. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not a fan well, of anyone. If really. you had to, if you had to vote in the U.S. and the choice was Biden or Trump, I, I reject no one, your. I reject your binary uh, uh, assignments. I would probably vote for a third party candidate. Which would mean you'd be voting for Trump almost certainly, because uh, given your no. politics, if you if you had to choose between left wing or right wing, I think you would choose left well, wing. Well, neither of neither of those are left wing in my book. The Democratic oh, well. Party is not a left wing party in the United States. Well, it's it's a, it's, it's, it's it's more left wing than the Republican Party. Yeah, but that doesn't long make, make it's left wing. Hitler is yeah. more left wing than the Republican Party, but I wouldn't vote <laughs> for Hitler either. Well, even. You know, I, I would have probably given Bernie Sanders my vote once upon a time, probably not anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't consider Biden by definitely not a left wing candidate or the DNC in general. Anyway, let's leave that for the bullshit filter show. We can get into <laughs> that. My headphones just beeped at me that they've run out of battery. So we should wrap this up. My ears are tired of these headphones being on them. I've got a pair okay. of head, I've got a pair of earphones like you, but I can't find them, so I dread. And they don't have the microphone. And this microphone, I think, is better than the one on my old my old pathetic ten or eleven year old iMac. I'm waiting for the I'm waiting for for the new uh, Mac Studios to come up with the M3, and then I'm going to upgrade the whole the whole ball of wax. Hopefully, in the All next right. few months. Great. Well, anyway, Thanks it's been wonderful, update. and I I want to I want to wish you, and 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 all all three of you, you and 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 and, and Chrissy and Fox, uh, the very best holiday season, whatever holiday you you choose to to celebrate, and certainly a happy New Year. And I would wish the same to all of our faithful listeners out there. Uh, it, it's just awesome to to know what kind of reach we have on, on something like this you know you gave me some numbers a, a year or so ago you know the the number of people that we have reached in many cases repeatedly because because they keep coming back for 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 more punishment uh it, it's just awesome to me and and i want to wish all of those of you who are listening and or watching again the happiest of whatever holiday season you choose to celebrate and a very, very great new year.